Hello, welcome to Virtual Stock 2020. I'm Josh, and I, along with Michal, will present the following pair of results. Order 1 approximation of edit distance on far inputs in near linear time by Michal and Mike, as well as constant factor approximation of near linear edit distance in near linear time by myself and Abhyan. We start by defining the edit distance problem. The edit distance between two strings, x and y, is the number of insertions, deletions, and substitutions needed to go from x to y. In this case, the edit distance between the two strings is 3. A classic dynamic programming algorithm can solve this problem exactly in quadratic time. Assuming the strong exponential time hypothesis, it is known that you cannot solve this problem in subquadratic time, like n to the 2 minus epsilon time. As such, we instead look at approximation algorithms for edit distance, for which there is a long line of work, which we will present on the next slide. To explain the previous work, we use the following graph. On the x-axis, we have the approximation factor, and on the y-axis, we have the running time. So the classic dp is a one approximation that runs in n squared time. There's a folklore algorithm which runs in linear time and gives a square root of n approximation, and this was progressively improved to giving an n to the 3 sevenths approximation in linear time, n to the 1 third approximation, n to the little o of 1, and, eventually, uh, and also polylog of n in n to the 1 plus epsilon time. Then, in the last couple of years, there was a breakthrough by BGHS which gave, in subquadratic time, a 3 plus epsilon approximation, ass um, assuming that you run your algorithm on a quantum computer. This was further followed up by CDGKS in their own breakthrough, which showed that in um, subquadratic time, you could get a 3 plus epsilon approximation classically. Uh, these were... these. Uh, Parameters were subsequently improved, both in the approximation and in the um, running time. But all of these required at least n to the 1.5 running time. What we present is a near linear time algorithm for approximate, giving a constant approximation for edit distance, with the additional caveat that we introduce an additive error of n to the 1 minus epsilon prime. Uh, We now formally state the main result. We showed that for any epsilon, we can approximate edit distance in time n to the 1 plus epsilon with a multiplicative factor of 1 over delta and an additive error of n to the 1 minus delta. Due to a recent uh, result of Aviad and Jiaosong, this directly implies an improved running time for a one-half plus delta approximation of the binary longest common subsequence problem in also near linear time. Since both of these results, there's been a recent breakthrough by Andoni and Nosatsky, which gives an n to the one plus epsilon time algorithm with a 1 over delta multiplicative factor, and no additive error. This thus completes the line of work of finding a constant factor approximation for edit distance in near linear time. There is still much to be known about approximate edit distance, particularly finding a 1 plus epsilon approximation algorithm in subquadratic time. All of the approximation algorithms, constant factor approximation algorithms known to date, have a particular technical detail which requires them to at least be a three approximation, the use of the triangle inequality, which we'll explain later in the talk. Thus, some fundamentally new idea is needed to get a one plus epsilon approximation algorithm. We now dive into the technical overview. We divide the 
algorithm into a variety of steps, each of which builds off of previous work, culminating in step three, which includes the new ideas for getting a near linear time algorithm with additive error. We first present the new techniques from the perspective of BR20, and then Michal will jump in and present the techniques from the perspective of KS20. All of these techniques, with the exception of step zero, end up being incorporated into the recent work of Vendoni and Osatsuki, so this overview can be viewed as a warm-up also for understanding their paper. The zeroth step is we partition the strings into what are known as windows. So we have a parameter d, which is going to be the length of each window, and then we have t, which is the number of windows. Think of each of these as approximately square root of n. And what we're going to do is we're going to break up each string into chunks of size d. So as we've done in this illustration, d is equal to 4. Then what we do is we try to match the strings uh, using the windows. So for instance, we try to match windows to windows, as well as make changes within windows, and delete or insert windows. So in this case, to go for between the two strings, you can delete two windows, insert two windows, as well as change two characters within one pair of windows. So this gives a total cost of the matching of 18. This is what we mean by window compatible matching. And uh, an important uh, argument of BEGHS is that there exists a window compatible matching with a cost of essentially one plus epsilon times the optimal. So by restricting our matchings to be window compatible, we have not fundamentally changed the answer to our problem. Furthermore, um, if we know the pairwise distances between all the windows, we can compute the optimal window compatible matching in order t squared time, where t is the number of windows. In particular, if t is about square root of n, then we could have a near linear time algorithm if we can efficiently compute the distances between windows. That is, we have a new goal of computing pairwise edit distance between windows. The problem is, is that naively there's d squared time is needed to compute between pairs, and there's t squared pairs total, which gives a n squared time algorithm. Thus, in order to do this, we need to approximately compute the edit distance for some of the pairs. For this new task, we consider the following query model. We have a bipartite graph where the vertices represent windows of the string, and we have edges between pairs that are within a certain edit distance tau. What we would like to do is discover edges in this graph by querying some of the edges and then applying some deduction rules. The idea is we want to discover edges that are approximately within this threshold, so it's okay to include edges of distance 3 tau. And we also want to find enough edges that we accurately compute the aggregate edit distance. This is a very important abstraction, and we will be using it for the next few minutes of the talk. So if you would like to absorb it a bit more, I recommend re-watching this portion on step zero. Now that we've discussed the abstraction of breaking into windows, we'll now um, understand some optimizations we can do in this model. The first is essentially what's going to be the dense case. So what do we mean? So just recall the setup. We have this bipartite graph. We have some method of querying edges. And we want um, to find enough good edges. 
So here's an idea. So we first take some edge a1, b1, it's random. And then what we're going to do is we're going to spend t time to query all the neighbors of b1, all the neighbors of a1. And we're going to take all the pairs. So essentially what happened is we're going to complete a clique. And the idea is by the triangle inequality, if we have this, if we complete this clique, any pair that's connected by a, the three step path we formed before has at a distance at most three times tau. So it's fine to include these edges in our graph. So let's assume that uh, of these t vertices, every one single one of them has degree delta. Then, using t queries, we can discover delta squared edges, which is what we did now because the clique is of size delta because the degrees of a1 and b1 are delta. Thus, because there's um, t delta edges total, and we have um, we use t queries to get delta squared edges to find all the edges, we need t times delta times t divided by delta squared time, or t squared over delta time, or uh, queries. Okay, so in particular, when delta is large. We beat t squared, and so we will beat um, the quadratic time up. I should emphasize that this step crucially uses the triangle inequality. Since we know that there's an edge from a2 to b1, a1 to b1, and a1 to b2, we are deducing there is an edge from a2 to b2. But because of this, you lose a factor of 3 in the approximation. And in fact, every algorithm to date that's known to be a constant factor approximation uses this triangle inequality step and thus its approximation factor will be at least three. A fundamentally new technique is needed to get a one plus epsilon approximation. Okay, so just to recap, we were uh, able to exploit this dense structure to get a t squared over delta query algorithm. Step one was the contribution of the quantum edit distance paper BEGHS, as they were able to use this query algorithm to save time when delta is large, and then they were able to use Grover's search to save time when delta is small. Since we would like such a result for classical computers, we now introduce step two from CDGKS, which learn sparse graphs efficiently using a seed and expand approach. This is essentially the core idea of the classical time breakthrough of CDGKS. So what do we do? Let's start again with an edge, say between A2 and A3. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna find all of the neighbors of A2. Um, let's just say A2 only has one neighbor, B3. And we're going to consider the intervals around this a2 and this b3. And now, what we can do is the following optimization. If we look at a3, since we know it's right by a2, we only need to check things that are right by b3. Since we know a2 matches the b3, a3 is probably going to match to b4 or b5. And you can make this precise that there exists a near optimal matching with what's known as low skew, that no pair of edges is ever going to um, diverge too much from each other. For instance, the edge A3BT is irrelevant. And if we think about this carefully, if we use approximately t queries, we can learn everything in an interval of size about t over delta. Thus, since we want to understand t vertices and we can understand t over delta vertices in t queries, we have a total of t delta queries to solve uh, this problem.
Thus, using the methods of BEGHS, we can get a t squared over delta query algorithm, and using the methods of CGGKS, we can get a t times delta query algorithm. By putting these two together, you can get uh, optimized around delta equals square root of t, you can get a t to the 1.5 query algorithm. But in order to get near linear time, we need to get the number of queries near linear. This is the part of the talk where the methods of uh, the two uh, papers being presented diverge. So first, I will present the methods used in BR20, and then Miha will jump in and discuss the methods used in KS20. So, to discuss uh, what's going on, we now are going to combine the approaches of uh, steps one and two. So, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take some point A2, and let's say we'll find its neighbors, say B on both sides. This is important. So say B3 on the bottom and A6 on the top. So now by triangle inequality, we also know that A6 is close to B3. So here's an idea. Let's consider intervals around A6 and B3. And the main idea here is for A6, we only need to look at uh, neighbors that are close to B3. So things that are close to A6, like A5 and A7, we only need to look at things close to B3, say B2, B1, or B4, B5. So essentially, we're doing both approaches at the same time. So again, let's assume the average degree is delta. So we did here roughly t queries. And we learn an interval of size approximately t over delta. But we have, because the degree is delta, we've learned essentially delta intervals. So if we put these together, delta intervals, and t times delta vertices per interval, we essentially get a query time per vertex of 1, so about t total queries. OK? So now we would explained how uh, step 3 works from the perspective of BR. We now have Michal jump in and discuss the techniques used in KS20. Thank you, Josh. So we look on this problem with Mike slightly differently, and we view it as like actually asymmetrically. So that's for that reason I'm actually going to draw x horizontally and y vertically. So this is my x and y. And we look on it as a data structure problem. So you give me a subinterval ai of x, and I want to actually find in y all subintervals which actually match it closely so they are at the distance of most theta from it so like this over here b5 and b17 are actually at most at distance theta so of course how do you do that well you could actually do it naively but then that would be actually way too costly so what we use is actually we use the technique of uh, the previous paper by cdgks to actually find these intervals so that technique is actually based on not actually looking for this directly, but actually sampling a short subinterval AI in, uh, in this big interval and finding all matches for that one actually in Y. Now the logic is that if, if I have a match for the big interval, then these short subintervals should also match. So if we find those and we just actually verify that, uh, that somehow the surrounding interval actually is a good match for, for the interval we care about, then, uh, then we are done. So that's actually the, the core idea of uh, the CGDKS paper and we use it actually again here. Of course, there is a problem with this technique if we actually pick a bad AI. So that's, uh, that's what uh, we call dense case. 
And in that case, actually, you just get too many candidates for this little a sub i. So instead of having just two, now you have actually five possible matches in y. And you cannot actually afford to expand them, because if you expand them, all of them, it would be just too costly. So what do you do instead? Actually, instead, you actually, in x, you actually find also all the subintervals, which actually are similar to, the, to this a sub i. So, so you actually look for all of them. And once you actually have them, then uh, just by triangle inequality, again, you can actually conclude that all these marked boxes actually are matches between the subintervals AIs and BJs. And this is exactly the same as Josh was talking about the their tense case. This is the bi-click we actually derive. Uh, in the, this situation, we cannot actually use these, uh, these mark boxes to, to try and expand them into the big interval. So we just actually collect the information about all these uh, dense cases and we later use it to derive information about the bigger, bigger intervals. So we do actually both and we have to combine both, both of these actually. So we have to combine the sparse case. So whenever we hit a sparse, sparse uh, subinterval, we actually expand uh, expand it into bigger ones. Whenever we hit actually dense interval, we just actually collect this dense information and we are done. So these are kind of two approaches we have to combine, but that's that's not all. So so everything I said so far basically corresponds to what <coughs> CDGKS is doing. So now what we do is actually we take it to multiple levels. So in multiple levels actually, we start with short intervals, which are actually going to be of uh, size squared of n. And we actually expand them, uh, we, we again use this sparse case, and we actually expand them into slightly bigger, bigger ones. So we find the matches, we expand them into w2, but we don't stop here. We actually, we go again and we actually expand them into w3, and we go like this. And for, for each size, actually w1, w2 up to wk, so we have actually k levels of this, for each of these levels, we actually have uh, some density threshold where it's actually still safe to actually expand farther and when it is actually not safe anymore. In this later case, when it's not safer anymore, we actually just collect the information, that's the dense case, and whenever we can actually expand more, we, we expand. So, so it's actually like quite subtle uh, technically and we have, to actually, we have to actually be careful about the parameters. Now that by itself actually doesn't really actually give you give you the almost a linear algorithm. So what we have to do is actually we have to actually use this idea recursively actually multiple times. So so what we get from this we get an algorithm which actually speeds up a little bit at the distance computation and it speeds up by by a small margin and we actually have to repeat this multiple times to get to almost linear. So. So this is roughly uh, the main idea in our algorithm. So now let's go back to the, into the studio. Josh? Thank you, Michal, for the explanation. Let's now recap. That a distance problem has had a number of results which show that it is unlikely that you can solve it exactly in subquadratic time. Even so, there's been a number of recent exciting papers which show that in subquadratic time or near linear time, you can get a large constant approximation. It remains to be seen what can be done, say, for a, a 1 plus epsilon approximation in subquadratic time, as was discussed earlier in the talk. Uh, thank you very much for watching this, and I hope to answer your questions uh, during Virtual Stock 2020.